About four summers ago, in weather pretty similar to last Monday, I was walking the Camino Portuguese from Porto to Santiago de Compostela. Now, a piece of advice, if you're on pilgrimage and you want to get into lots of conversations with strangers, wear an outfit like this. Comments like, it's great that you're doing it in fancy dress. And my reply, no, this is what I wear every day. Put the person in such a state of embarrassment that you can get away with a lot more preaching than people would usually tolerate. Anyway, one evening I'd been chatting to a German mother and daughter in a pilgrim hostel and then went off to get a bite to eat and a great bit of uh, advice for you all about Portugal and as a holiday destination is that you can get a three course meal and wine for six euros. So even a friar in a vow of poverty could dine out. And at dinner, I was chatting to a whole host of people from countries including Italy, Spain, Germany, Brazil, and South Africa. And over the course of the evening, the, the Brazilian man who was on pilgrimage with his wife, when we went to the bar to get a drink, he started to tell me about the stomach cancer that was slowly killing him. And I ended up praying over him with my hands on his stomach, which isn't something that used to happen to me at dinners back when I was a lawyer, but is a beautiful part of the vocation God has given me now. But most of my dinner was spent chatting to a South African lady, and we were having a really good laugh together and sharing tales of various travel adventures. And dinner over, we wandered back to the hostel, and the South African lady went pretty much straight to bed whilst I got chatting to the German mother and daughter again. I'm afraid I'm one of those terrible people who chats in dormitories, I blame that upon my boarding school education. But at least I'm not one of the people who pack on pilgrimage who packs things at 5 a.m. in plastic bags. If plastic bags had existed in Dante's time, there would have been a special circle in hell for such people. <laughs> anyway, it's good we've got some people who know Dante and who also hate plastic bag packers. But as we chatted, it turned out that the German mother was having a bit of an identity crisis. With her daughter about to leave home, she said she didn't really know who she was anymore. But she was also interested about what a friar did all day. Perhaps she was one of those people who thought that priests only work one hour on a Sunday and don't realise that sometimes they have two masses on a Sunday or even give a talk on a Monday from time to time. But I spoke about the basic pattern of our lives, the prayers, the mass, the study. But I also said that one of the great privileges is that you get let into the really deep moments in so many people's lives. You get to be there at times of ecstatic joy and you get to be besides them at times of enormous sadness, trying to bring something of Christ into the joy and the pain. And that's been even more true to me in the past two years in my work in the hospital perhaps never more true than about a year ago as an hour before a wedding I got a call to give the last rites to a lady who had hanged herself and had little time left to live and then had to go back to the church to marry a couple on the happiest day of their lives. You get to bring Christ into both of those moments, it's a privilege. But I was saying to the German lady that you never know who's going to turn up at the door or who would call in a time of crisis, and that it wasn't always Catholics. Sometimes it was Muslims, agnostics, atheists. I've even been called to pray the Psalms with a dying Jewish lady when the rabbi couldn't come to the hospital because it was the Sabbath. And then the South African lady, who I thought was asleep, said, Toby, I'd have been one of those people. And she proceeded to tell me that she was supposed to be walking the pilgrimage with her son, but that he had died of a drugs overdose two weeks before. And this happy-go-lucky lady in the restaurant was now sharing with me her exquisite pain. And what do you say in such a situation? And my mind turned to the statues in churches all along the Camino that I'd seen, much like Michelangelo's Pieta in Rome, Mary with her son lying limply dead in her lap. And it seemed to me that in that moment, I wasn't being asked for words that would take away the pain, 
but perhaps just she desired to be a little less alone. Because I think that's the worst thing about pain and suffering, the way they isolate us. And so I pointed to Mary, Mary who was without sin, holding Jesus, her son, the one who came to die for our sins. And I hoped that it might make her feel a little less alone. And also to point to a day when things would not be as they are now. A day when she might be reunited with her son in heaven, just as Jesus is with his mother. Because Jesus doesn't undo our past but he does change our present and our futures. He came into the world not to dodge human suffering, not even to take it all away, at least not instantly, but to transform it. And I think in all the pain and the suffering in our lives, it can be good to remember this. The Holy Family, Jesus, Mary and Joseph, know our pain and it has not had and it will not have the final word. The Brazilian man with stomach cancer, like St. Joseph, dying too early, living, leaving behind a family and a widow. The South African lady, like Mary, losing a son. And the German mother, like Mary, wondering who she will be now without her child. All this pain has been known in the Holy Family. And if you feel pain, I don't know the situations of your lives, but if you feel pain, it does not mean that you are far from Christ. Sometimes, in fact, we need to endure the pain to stay close. Love hurts. Sometimes it would be easier to forget. Sometimes remembering those we have lost and loved hurts. But remembering in spite of the pain is part of the way we love. And one thing religious life has taught me is that even families that look rosy and perfect on the outside have their struggles. Struggles that can seem too much for us to bear. That would, I think, be too much for us to bear had Jesus not entered into them. The shortest verse in the whole Bible is Jesus wept. Jesus, in his humanity, knew all that we would suffer and all that he was to suffer, and he wept, but he also transformed it. Back though to, the, to my story of the Camino, a couple of days later, one of the ladies I had met said to me, Toby, how do you cope with all the sadness, with all the pain that people tell you about? And I told her, thinking myself a bit clever, how it wasn't me who had to cope with it, and that I just prayed the rosary for them each day. But she said to me, hearing all that pain has got to affect you. And she told me that she just wouldn't be able to listen to it and that she'd just have to say, I'm sorry, this is too much for me. And I thought her a little bit self-concerned at the time. But I'd never really thought about this before. And her question and her comment hit a nerve in some way, but not one I recognized in that moment. And so I carried along the way, praying the rosary each day and remembering in my intentions all those who told me about their pain and suffering, but not really affected by it. And a few days later, I arrived in Santiago de Compostela and I prayed at the tomb of the Apostle St. James. I went to confession, which is where we tell the priest our sins and receive through him God's forgiveness. And later I went to Mass in that magnificent cathedral. And after I received Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament, that small piece of what was once bread, I knelt on the stone floor beneath the cross and I said something that I don't think I would have said had it not been for the comment of the lady a couple of days earlier. I said, Lord, I bring you the pain of all these people I can carry it alone no longer. And at the moment I said it, I think I said it in a theoretical way, but in the act of saying it, the word became flesh. It ceased to be theoretical and I burst into tears and I sobbed and I sobbed and I sobbed and I really didn't care what anybody else might be thinking. They were the most beautiful tears of my life 
I felt a weight lifted from me and taken up by Jesus on his cross. And I'm not somebody who's particularly prone to religious sentiment and emotions, but in those tears, I don't think I've ever felt as close to Christ in my whole life. And wounds that day, that wounds that days before I didn't even know I had, were healed in that moment. And I don't think they were just the wounds of other people that I was wearing. What I now realize was going on in the moment was a real moment of mercy. I'd been hearing the pain of all these people and I was sorry for them, but not with my whole person, only with my head and not with the heart, not in the place where I might suffer with them. I hadn't loved them enough for that. And so my prayer for them had been somewhat perfunctory, somewhat going through the motions. They were empty, not incarnate words, because their pain remained theirs and it wasn't mine. But in that moment, I began to feel and I began to suffer with them and I began to have something of the compassion of Jesus for them. And I think because this gift had been given to me in the Mass, Jesus was really in it. Because as well as the suffering, I felt healing. I think for the first time in my life, I felt what was happening at the Mass and not just thought about it. And both those things matter. I felt the suffering of Christ on the cross and also the joy of the love and the hope with which he stayed on it. As St. Catherine of Siena said, it wasn't the nails that held him on the cross, but love. And I don't need that moment to be repeated over and over again to know that it was true and to know that Jesus is always there in the Blessed Sacrament not just when I feel it. But that moment was a gift, a gift that will never leave me. And I pray you might receive some such gift at some point if you have never before. And there are a few reasons why I share this story. The first is that we don't always realize that we're hurting and we don't always realize that we need healing. And maybe sometimes the biggest healing that we need is being able to feel, being able to have real compassion. Because I've always been far too proud about being strong, about not needing any help. I prided myself on being the sort of person who people come to for help and not being the sort of person who needs to ask for it. And I've not really absorbed that part of what it means to come to Jesus as a little child, that that's to come with radical dependence and to feel no shame about that. But this lady who'd asked me the question, how do you cope, had pointed out something I hadn't realized for myself, that the burden that people were placing on me was too much for me, or at least it was too much for me to carry by myself if I was to truly have compassion for them. They said, I've been praying for the people who are hurting, but not entering into their hurt it had never occurred to me to fast or to take on some hardship for the sake of their suffering and to enter into it more fully. And nor had I been truly allowing Jesus into the situation. I had my pride in my own strength and that was blocking the strength that they needed. I was seeking to be the strong one and forgetting that it's Jesus who is our fortress and our rock. And it's when we acknowledge our weakness and let him in, that only at that point that we can start to become strong. But there's another point it's really important to make, and it's not always what we want to hear. It's that some of the healing that we undergo won't necessarily bring an end to our suffering. There's a tendency in some Christian preaching to imply that if only we loved Jesus enough, then we would cease to suffer that we'd have no financial worries, that we wouldn't quarrel with our spouses and that our kids would be better behaved than Jesus. But that's a counterfeit form of Christianity. There's a rather beautiful passage from Carol Hauslander's book, The Risen Christ, on just this point, on how suffering this side of eternity remains essential to the Christian life. She writes, we should not forget 
that Christ did not bring the suffering of his passion to us. He brought his infinite love to us. It was we who gave the suffering to him. He gives suffering the power of love. And therefore, when we accept the suffering necessarily involved in living the Christ life in this world, we are not submerging ourselves more deeply into suffering than we need have done, but are doing something which will transform it ultimately into joy. God is not the God of quick fixes. He invites us to walk alongside him and to bear his cross so that we might also share in his resurrection. The Christian life is a pilgrimage and the Eucharist which looks like plain bread, but is really the living bread, which is Jesus, is our food for the journey. In the Eucharist, all that suffering on the cross is contained. Every pain in your heart and soul, every pain in your body right now is known by Jesus because he's God and he can know. And it's all wrapped up in those small hosts on the altar, those little pieces of what look like bread. That's the simultaneous greatness and humility of God, that so much could be contained under the appearance of bread. As Jesus was raised up on the cross, his suffering was not principally his own, but ours. He knew all our suffering on the cross. He knew each of you in this room as you are and he did not die on the cross for some abstract notion of humanity being god he knows each of us as we are and so his pain was more than just physical pain he knew the pain of our sin and the pain of our separation from god and that's the paradox at the heart of christianity it's the paradox that to be healed we have to be prepared to go to Christ and to go to the cross with him. But the beauty of Christianity is that our suffering ceases to, ceases to be futile when we join it to Jesus's. Simone Weil, a great French mystic, once said that the extreme greatness of Christianity lies in the fact that it does not seek a supernatural remedy for suffering, but a supernatural use for it. And the supernatural use that Simone Weil talks about is nothing less than a sharing in the redemptive suffering of Christ. Suffering for the Christian is no longer in vain. Perhaps the most loving words I've ever heard in my life were when I spoke to a woman in the hospital about the suffering that she was undergoing, terrible suffering caused by the cancer which riddled her entire body. And she asked, why am I suffering? And I told her, I don't know. But I said that I don't think this has to be in vain. I told her of what Simone Weil said. And I read her St. Paul to the Colossians, where he says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh, I complete what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. I said to her that I think her suffering could be part of the work of Jesus, the work whereby Jesus saves all the people she loves, but that I do not know why she suffers. And you know what she said? In that case, Lord, increase my suffering. They're the most loving words I've ever heard another person speak. It's the realization this lady had, I think, that meant that Simone Weil could also write, love of God is pure when joy and suffering can inspire an equal gratitude. That's something I get in theory, but still don't really live in practice. Not yet, but I do want to. I want to close with some words from the gospel and try and keep them in mind if you go into the chapel later this evening. And when you do, I'd encourage you to go in there with your mask lowered. Let Jesus see you as you are, so that he can love you as you are. And trust that he does. 
We spend so much time constructing an image, worried if someone saw the real us, that we wouldn't be loved. And then worrying that because nobody sees the real me, because of the mask that I'm wearing, that nobody loves me as I am. Drop that tonight. It's a good thing about pilgrimage if you ever go. It makes us raw. But trust that when you're with Jesus tonight in that chapel, it's the place all the facades, all the pretense can stop. Come before Jesus and see yourself as you are. And remember, that means seeing yourself as loved. And so I'm going to close with words from the, the gospel because I want those to be the last words that I say. But perhaps in the conversation that follows, you might want to think about some of the pressures that you feel to sort of wear various different masks, some of the things that, that stop you from, from really showing who you are and what, why you're feeling what you feel right now. And maybe think about how a life could be lived, which was a, a little more honest a little more vulnerable and a lot more open. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him and he was beside the sea. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had had a flow of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I shall be made well. And immediately the hemorrhage ceased and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus perceiving in himself that power had gone forth from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had been done to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him, and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease.